Mamet's Wood by Owen Shears appeared in his 2005 collection Skirid Hill. Skirid derives from a Welsh word, which can be translated as both shattered and separated. And Shears uses these poems to explore ideas of divisions and boundaries, not only in ruptured physical terrain, such as seen in the geographical form of the hill itself, which gives its name to the title of the collection, and the farmer's field in Mamet's Wood, the ploughing of which periodically turns up the bones of soldiers of the First World War, but also in ruptured psychological and emotional terrain, such as in the boundaries between the living and the dead, and in the deterioration of relationships through linguistic divides and broken communication. Mamet's Wood in northeastern France is the site of a battlefield from the First Battle of the Somme, one of the bloodiest battles of the First World War. The attack took place between the 7th and the 12th of July 1916 and involved the 38th Welsh Division, which had been instructed to clear the large and overgrown wood of the German enemy. As the first wave of Allied soldiers advanced across the farmer's field, having been commanded to make a frontal assault in broad daylight, they were mown down by machine gun fire and shelling from the German strongly fortified position. 400 men were either killed or injured before they even reached the wood and were hastily buried on the spot. Shears was inspired to write this poem after a trip to the site for the purposes of making a short film about Welsh writers involved in the conflict. He says, While I was there, they uncovered a shallow grave of twenty Allied soldiers who had been buried very, very quickly, but whoever had buried them had taken the time to actually link their arms, arm in arm. And when I saw a photograph of this grave, I just knew that it was one of those images that had burned itself onto my mind, and I knew that I would want to write about it eventually. As it happens, I did, but the poem took a long time to surface, very much in the same way that those elements of the battle are still surfacing through the fields 85 years later. An official memorial located near the site, consisting of a three-metre stone plinth topped by a Welsh red dragon tearing at barbed wire with its claws, was erected in 1987 by the Welsh sculptor David Peterson. The poem explores themes such as the horror and wastefulness of war and how this should be memorialised suggesting that Shears sees the periodic and gruesome turning up of soldiers' remains as a more fitting tribute to their memory than the glorification of war through public art. The poem comprises seven stanzas of three lines each. It's written in free verse, which means that it has no fixed rhythmical structure or bass meter and no set rhyme scheme. Shears does, however, employ slant or oblique rhymes such as sung and earthing tongues and extensive enjambment and caesura, which he uses to modulate the rhythm, creating ebbs and flows which complement the poem's meaning. The poem is elegiac in tone as the poet laments the loss of soldiers whom he describes as the wasted young. He employs rather plain diction, combining words to create striking metaphors and similes and intricate sound patterning. There's visual imagery which mixes words forming semantic fields relating to the military and to nature, such as chits of bone, nesting machine guns, and the earth stands sentinel perhaps suggesting not only the way in which the men have become mingled with the soil, but also how the war has made an indelible mark on the natural world. This is further underlined by the way in which Shears personifies an injured land, the skeletons of the soldiers within it implicitly likened to shrapnel embedded in its skin, working its way gradually to the surface as the body seeks to expel it. 
Alliterations such as chit and china, consonants such as shoulder blade and broken mosaic linked, and assonants such as broken mosaic of bone, give the poem a sense of musicality and cohesion and serve to amplify Shears's meaning. There's extensive use of harsh consonant sounds such as in chit and china, plosives seen here in plough blades and blown and broken bird's egg, as well as hissing sibilance, seen here in surface of the skin, all of which help not only to evoke the sense of violence characterising the men's deaths, but also the sense of release as their bodies and their stories are finally unearthed some 85 years afterwards. The title Mamet's Wood is a simple one, referring not only to a geographical location, but also to the bloody battle that was waged there and to the gruesome legacy that lies beneath it. The poem begins, For years afterwards the farmers found them, the wasted young turning up under their plough blades as they tended the land back into itself. Shears introduces the reader here to the idea of the farmers going about their day-to-day -day business, turning up or bringing to the surface the bones of the buried soldiers as they plough their fields. The adverbial for years afterwards evokes the idea that the earth appears to be giving up the bodies of the dead soldiers in drips and drabs gradually releasing them in a constant reminder of the horror of war. The way in which Shears uses a personal pronoun, them, before the noun phrase to which it refers, the poignant, the wasted young, places emphasis on the phrase and highlights the sense of futility that the poet feels at the way these lives were needlessly and incompetently squandered by those in command which is also reflected in the almost casual way that they just turn up, in the manner that things lost and forgotten tend to do. The way in which the farmers tended the land back into itself communicates a sense of care and protection, enhanced by the consonants of the and sounds here intended and land, as they look after and rehabilitate it, in an attempt to restore its pre-war identity and character. The second stanza describes the remains that are brought to the surface in a vivid series of metaphors. A chit of bone, the china plate of a shoulder blade, the relic of a finger, the blown and broken bird's egg of a skull. The men have been reduced to mere fragments of bone, a chit is another word for a short official letter or note and conjures the whiteness as well as the smallness of the bone fragments. Larger pieces, such as of shoulder blade, are china plates. The image not only suggesting their whiteness, but also their flat smoothness, while the harsh alliteration of the ch sounds, which links these two images, helps perhaps to evoke their brittle hardness or to subtly suggest the sound of distant machine gun fire. Fragments of finger bones are described as relics, not only suggesting artefacts that have survived from an earlier time, but also perhaps the term's alternative meaning, that of the parts of a deceased holy person's body, which are kept as objects of reverence. While the image of the blown and broken bird's egg of a skull conveys delicacy and fragility which has been destroyed through violence. The plosive alliteration here, in combination with the assonant long O sounds in blown and broken, enhancing the sense of brutality. The third stanza develops the visual imagery of these bones as they are all mimicked now in flint, breaking blue in white across this field. The men's bones mingle with and are barely distinguishable from flint, a common blue-grey stone which often has a white surface layer. Note once more the plosive alliteration of breaking blue, 
which evokes the way in which fragments of the men's skeletons almost explode to the surface, liberated at last. As they do so, in an example of form reflecting content, the past and present also mingle in this stanza, as Shears refers to the field as it was 85 years ago, where the men were told to walk, not run, towards the wood and its nesting machine guns. There's a sense here of frustration at the incompetent strategising of those in command, which effectively turned the men into sitting ducks, as they slowly made their way towards the German artillery in broad daylight. There's also a deep sense of irony, as usually children are told to walk, not run, in order to keep them safe, whereas here it has had the opposite effect. It also reminds us of just how young some of these men actually were. Note how Shears combines the adjective nesting, which usually refers to breeding birds as they hatch eggs to bring new life into the world, with the machine guns which will indiscriminately mow the men down in a hail of bullets, to describe how the German artillery, breeding death instead of life, is firmly ensconced in its position in the wood. This juxtaposition of positive natural vocabulary with negative technological vocabulary, creating a menacing and horrifying feeling, especially in the context of the image of the broken bird's egg of a skull at the end of the previous stanza. Shears returns to the present in the fourth stanza as he describes how even now the earth stands sentinel. Here he personifies the earth. To stand sentinel is to stand guard like soldiers, watching and protecting. The way in which it reaches back into itself for reminders of what happened suggests that Rather than a passive receptacle for the men's remains, which are brought to the surface merely by the action of the plough blades, it is an active force, intentionally pushing them up to remind humankind of the true cost of war. The simile, like a wound working a foreign body to the surface of the skin, makes this personification even more explicit, as it portrays the earth as having been wounded or injured by the battle. The men's remains a foreign body or alien presence, almost like shrapnel, with the body's natural impulse to expel it by pushing it out. Even though it is customary to bury the dead, there's a feeling that the earth senses how repugnant it is, not only for these young men to have been brutally slaughtered here in the first place, but also for them to have been buried here hurriedly, where they fell instead of in their home country, in the middle of a field with no headstone, either to identify them or to mark their sacrifice, their resting place constantly disturbed by the agricultural practices going on overhead. Shears brings the poem into an even more specific present, as he recounts that this morning more remains have been discovered, twenty men buried in one long grave, here, the horrific reality of death on the battlefield is made clear. In the heat of battle, fallen soldiers needed to be buried quickly, without ceremony and often in unmarked mass graves. He describes their appearance using the metaphor of a broken mosaic of bone linked arm in arm. A mosaic is a picture or pattern which is created by the arrangement of many small pieces of coloured stone, tile or glass, and refers to ancient finds that are made on archaeological digs on Roman sites, for example. Instead of colourful tiles, however, the picture confronting shears is made up of fragments of bone. This somewhat grotesque image suggests the idea of a fragile society, made up of individuals, that has been violently and dangerously fragmented. Something which was once beautiful, has now been destroyed. Note the way in which Shears interweaves plosive alliteration of broken and bone, here along with the consonants of the guttural k sounds present in broken, mosaic and linked, as well as the assonance of the long o sounds in broken, mosaic of bone, 
to create his own mosaic of harsh sounds that evokes not only the violence of their deaths, but also the shock of their discovery. What is also striking about this image is that it is simultaneously grotesque and beautiful, with the men lying there linked arm in arm, a symbol of comradeship and connection which the atrocities of the war were not able to destroy. The image also appears to Shears' eyes as that of their skeletons paused mid dance macabre. The dance macabre, or dance of death, was a genre of painting popular in the late Middle Ages, which served as a memento mori, Latin for remember that you must die, which showed a personification of death, summoning people from all levels of society to dance towards the grave. The message being that no matter what possessions or position you have here on earth, the same fate awaits us all. The sixth stanza continues the sentence started in the previous stanza, as Shears describes the skeletons as wearing boots that outlasted them. The grotesquely absurd and ironic image of skeletons wearing nothing but boots, which have managed to withstand the effects of decomposition over very many decades buried in the farmer's field, but which often rotted on the men's feet in the waterlogged trenches highlights the pathos and futility of the wasted lives of these men who died while their boots were still new. The grotesque imagery continues with a description of their socketed heads tilted back at an angle and their jaws, those that have them, dropped open. The phrase their socketed heads perhaps refers not only to the eye sockets with their missing eyeballs, but also to the hole at the base of the skull through which the spinal cord and brainstem pass, which would be visible if their heads were tilted back. Their jaws, the only movable bones in the skull, have dropped open, their supporting muscles long since rotted away, while the phrase, those that have them, hints at the brutal manner of their slaughter, as many were shot in the face by machine guns at close range. There are a couple of interesting points to make about the structure of these two stanzas. Firstly, notice how Shear's sentence here extends over two complete stanzas, with the transition between the two in jammed, and so not permitting the reader to pause. This lends this part of the poem a somewhat breathless feel, as though the image is so intricate and arresting that the poet is himself unable to tear his gaze away as he takes in all of its shocking details. Secondly, notice also how the sentence is effectively a minor sentence, in that it has no finite verb. Verbs, of course, indicate either an action or a state of being at a particular point in time, i.e. in the past, the present or the future. The fact that Shears deliberately omits this information suggests the way in which this image seems timeless, reflecting the way in which the skeletons appear paused and providing a moment in which the past and the present collide. The final stanza picks up on the image at the end of the previous one of the men's heads being tilted back at an angle and their jaws being dropped open. It is as if the notes they had sung have only now with this unearthing slipped from their absent tongues. Once more, Shears, in the image of the men's absent tongues, makes oblique reference to the way in which their muscles and flesh have long since rotted away. The men appear, however, as though they are singing, their heads leaning back and their mouths wide open, a particularly appropriate image, given the strong Welsh tradition of male voice choirs, and the harmonies in which they sing. Note how the notes just slip out, implying willingness and ease. The earth in which they have been buried, having effectively muffled their voices for nearly a hundred years, has now been removed, allowing the dead to finally communicate with the living, and so bear witness to the atrocities that took place on that day. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. 
Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.